To me, Ruth is a story of hope. And we need more of these kinds of stories in our minds because it's so easy for us uh, to complain when things don't go our way. And we live in a kind of world where we, we can't expect, we don't expect things to always be smooth sailing for us. Uh, we buy insurance, we, we take vaccines, we've seen enough of our world to know that well, we need to manage our expectations accordingly. But even then, when things happen to us, uh, when it's our turn to face a season of trouble and you feel stuck in a rut and you don't have no clear way out, it is so easy then to whinge and to get discouraged or you might get cynical you might get angry or even bitter because of your lot in life. We do it in big things, we do it in small things. Could be your health. Uh, could be your employment situation. Maybe there's unpleasant conflicts happening in your, uh, the relational dynamics of your family or in your friendships or in your neighborhood. Maybe you've lost something or someone. Some of us try to do what Stoics do, the stiff upper lip, you harden up and just take it on the chin, you resign yourself to endure it. And plenty of people try to do just that. We've seen generations before us uh, do that same thing and maybe that's how it's going to be. But when things are serious... Often we need more than just the strength of our own threshold for pain to get us through. And we also need more than just blind optimism. You need, you need a hope that's actually grounded in reality if you're going to get through this. And sometimes it's hard to see. It really is. Uh, Naomi, one of the key characters in the book of Ruth, she expresses it well. Uh, when she feels like she's lost everything of value, in her life, she's lost her husband, she's lost her adult children. They're, they're gone, they've died tragically and too soon. And Naomi is left empty. And at one point, um, she says this, uh, Don't call me Naomi. Naomi means pleasant, that's what the name means. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, which is the word for bitter. Because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Lord Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. And she is not in a good space. Even though she would say, and she essentially does, share, does say, that there's no more hope in my life, the one thing she has going for her is that she does at least have the good sense to pick herself up from where she was in Moab and she heads back to Israel. They, they left Israel as a family because of a famine. Uh, they migrated across the border to Moab to make a new life for themselves there. And it was in Moab that Naomi's husband and her sons died. But, but now, 1 verse 6, when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she'd been living and set back out on the road that would take them to the land of Judah. Now there is simple hope that's grounded in reality. There's news of food in Israel again, and it was apparently God has come to help. And so Naomi moves herself in a very practical hope up from where she is in Moab to the place where she's heard God's blessing has come. She goes back to Israel, which is, I think, a smart thing to do. The other key character in this book is, is Ruth. And Ruth is one of Naomi's daughters-in-law. And she, too, is not in a good way. She's, she's just lost her husband, as we've said. You get the impression that Ruth and her husband hadn't been married for all that long. They didn't have any children yet. And while she could have gone back home to, to her own mum and dad, instead she chooses to stick with Naomi, the mother-in-law. Uh, this is again chapter 1 verse 15. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. 
But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. And she really meant it. And so Naomi lets her come with. But the short-term prospects for Ruth aren't great in Israel. I imagine she'd still be dealing with her grief. But on top of that, she's got this long journey ahead of her on foot to a foreign country where she doesn't know anyone. She, as she looks forward to this country she's heading to, she might very well be discriminated against because she's from Moab and the countries of Israel and Moab, they didn't get along. Is any Israeli going to give her the time of day once she ends up getting there? Her future is uncertain. They're going to need to find a way to get by once they arrive in Israel. And maybe Ruth can find some work or someone to work for, but until she gets there, she has no idea, no way of knowing. But God sees her, and God has heard. When, when Ruth said to Naomi, your people will be my people, and your God, my God, that's not something that anyone says lightly. And she meant every word. And God heard. And, she, and he, God knew that she meant it. And so he, he takes her up on her word, having heard Ruth's commitment, not just to Naomi, but also to him. Your God will be my God, was what Ruth said. And for Ruth to claim God as being her God, even though she's a foreigner and she might not know very much about what God is like, she's said it and he's heard her. She's thrown her lot in with him, with the God of Israel, and she does it sincerely, and God will honor that in ways that she couldn't have possibly imagined. And so what we've seen in the next couple of chapters that we've looked over the last uh, few weeks here, chapters 2 and 3 in Ruth, you see God giving Ruth and Naomi the beginnings of a real and concrete hope for a future in Israel. As they come back to the city of Bethlehem in Judah, uh, first they, they need food. And they find grace that meets them at that point of need in the form of the kindness of this wealthy landowner, Boaz, who, as you know, he lets Ruth onto his property. He lets Ruth take some of the leftover grain from his fields where he's harvesting. Uh, Israel's law, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, gave permission for foreigners and widows to pick up grain from other people's fields to feed themselves if they were in need. But Boaz goes way above and beyond the basic requirement of that law. And he shows incredible kindness to Ruth. You see back in chapter 2, he gives her so much more help in collecting that food. He asks his men to make sure that she's looked after and treated well while while she's on the property. He goes and invites her to eat at his table at mealtime. He tells her to go and take from the water the men have filled up uh, in the water jars so she doesn't have to go to the well to, to, to fill up. And considering the circumstances, Ruth's three months during the harvest where she gets to work with Boaz, they've been pretty good. But it can't go on forever. The harvest uh, is about to be over. And where we left off last time was in chapter 3 where uh, they know the harvest time is about to end. And under Naomi's prompting, Ruth has gone to Boaz in the middle of the night at the end of the harvest season. She's found him in the grain shed, sleeping after a hard day's work, and she's woken him up, and she's popped the big question. Boaz, will you be my man? Will you be my guardian redeemer and take me and Naomi under your wing and provide a future for me and for our family? And this marriage proposal doesn't come from nowhere. Uh, Let me remind you of this strange law in Israel she's invoking here, uh, Deuteronomy 25. I think I showed you this last time, uh, the first part of it. Uh, I'll show you the extended version today because there's an account coming up in our story uh, that this goes on to explain. Uh, Deuteronomy 25, starting at verse 5, says this. This is one of the old laws of Israel in the Old Covenant. If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. 
Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. However, if a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she shall go to the elders of the town gate and say, My husband's brother refuses to carry on his brother's name in Israel. He will not fulfill the duty of a guardian redeemer to me. Then the elders of his town shall summon him and talk to him. But if he persists in saying, I do not want to marry her, his brother's widow shall go up to him in the presence of the elders, take off one of his sandals, spit in his face and say, this is what is done to the man who will not build up his brother's family line. That man's line shall be known in Israel as the family of the unsandaled. And this guardian redeemer marriage situation isn't usually so much about uh, romantic love as it is, as you can say, it's more about the survival of the family's name and the welfare and provision uh, for this widow who would otherwise be left to fend for herself. At least this way she's cared for and there's hope for a future generation and the children could be born and a, ba- a family to be built through this marriage with this guardian redeemer relative. And for this deceased family line to continue. And as a guardian redeemer, refusing to fulfill your obligation in this way is, it's not illegal, but it's a matter of deep shame. You can refuse, but then you're going to be known forever as being the guy who refused to help. Uh, May you be spat on and may you be impoverished yourself, not even having a pair of shoes to wear. I think it's what that business with the sandals is about as a bit of a symbolic curse on the one who refuses to help a childless widow. Witnessed by the elders of the town and remembered into antiquity. And so when Ruth comes to Boaz with this kind of marriage proposal, this very intimate plea for help as a childless widow, and asks him to act as her guardian redeemer, which he was in a position to do since he was a relative in the same clan as her, uh, in the same clan as Naomi's husband, the law applies to him and Boaz says, I would be honoured to. But there's this other man in town who's also part of our clan who you haven't met yet, but he has an even greater right to act in this role as guardian redeemer Before I do, says Boaz. Uh, It reminds me a bit of the royal succession to the throne. You you get in line, and depending on how you're related, some people get first dibs. And that's back in chapter 3, verse 11. Uh, Boaz says, uh, she's asked him, and and she says, Now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask. All the people of my town know that you're a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer for our family... There is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night and in the morning if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good, let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. And that's where I left you hanging last time. Uh, The sun's come up, Ruth's gone home, and let's see how this story finishes. Uh, Chapter 4, verse 1. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down just as the guardian redeemer he'd mentioned came along. And Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should... Bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of those seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know, for no one has the right to do it except you, and I am the next in line. I will redeem it, he said. And you, as the sympathetic audience, cry out with Boaz. You can imagine what Boaz is thinking. No! This other guy is going to this other guy is going to redeem her. After 3 chapters, this is how the story ends. No, not quite. Cuz notice Boaz hasn't even mentioned 
Ruth yet. All he said was, Naomi is selling the land that belonged to her husband. And I imagine how that worked would be that Naomi could then take that substantial amount of money she would get for selling the property. It's not Sydney house prices, but it would still be a lot. And that money would be what she could foreseeably live off uh, for the rest of her life. And this would be a win-win situation. Naomi and this guardian redeemer comes out of it winning because Naomi will be looked after financially. And uh, even if she hasn't got anyone left in her family, no sons, no husband, she has this, um, this bit of money she can retire on. And for the guardian redeemer, he wins too because he's not just only he's, just, he's done his good deed for the day, but more than that, he's also just doubled his land holdings overnight, which it sounds like he could afford to do. And it'd be a great opportunity to pounce on as an investment for the future. He is the first in line to make an offer. And so he says, you beauty, I will redeem that piece of land. But this is where Boaz pulls out his trump card. Almost like he knew how this was how the conversation was going to go. All right, verse 5. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, oh, Then I cannot redeem it because it might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. There's a catch. There's, there's some fine print. There is a childless widow in the mix. And that complicates things. It's not just a financial contract now. There are relationships involved. There's a needy person to help, which is the whole purpose of this whole guardian redeemer thing in the first place. It's Naomi. Um, but this guardian redeemer wouldn't be obligated to marry Naomi, the mother-in-law, if he redeems her land, because Naomi's already had children. Uh, but with her children, Naomi's children, that's where the family line stopped. And that's exactly where this family needs help. Naomi's sons passed away without an heir, but with a surviving wife. And this would be the rare situation where that Deuteronomy 25 law comes in. To continue the family line, the guardian redeemer had an obligation to help, not just financially, but in marriage to produce an heir with the surviving widow. And their, their heir would take on the family name, not of the guardian redeemer, but of the, the man who was deceased. And when this first son out of this marriage, when he comes of age, the inheritance would go back to him. And so the, the, everything will be retained into that original family's line. And so suddenly this man, who was keen just a moment ago, suddenly he can't afford to pay the price. Because, you I mean, I don't actually get anything out of this. I marry a woman I don't know, I produce an heir for her family and then I give the property back to them. What's, what's in it for me? Why would I do this at cost to me? It seems this man is not interested so much in God's purposes to protect the poor or to carry the burden of his relative's family who's in need. And certainly not when the price he has to pay is so high. Because he's got his own family, he's got his own estate to worry about. No thank you, Boaz. It's all yours. Verse 8. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal. He takes off his shoe. He knew the tradition. He relinquishes his role to redeem so that Boaz can do it. And so he takes off his sandal in the presence of the elders and the witnesses as if to officially say, let it be known that I am not fulfilling my obligations to help this family that I am technically responsible to be the guardian redeemer of. There is, there is interestingly, no record of Ruth then coming up to him to spit on his face and to take the sandal and to pronounce a curse on him for all time. Uh, perhaps they're not following everything in the Deuteronomy law at this point in time. Maybe Ruth just wasn't there to do it. But it is, I think, a shameful thing, a publicly shameful thing for this man to refuse to help like this with the elders and everyone sort of watching. He's not even named in this whole story, if you noticed. Perhaps to protect his identity for shame, or perhaps because he's just not worth remembering. Who wants to remember 
some selfish man who doesn't meet his obligations. Forget about him. But Boaz, Boaz they bless. Here's the hero, verse 9. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, that's her husband, Kilion and Marlon, the sons. I've also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Marlon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his, his family or his hometown. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family line be like that of Perez, whom Tamar brought to Judah. They're all positive blessings they're trying to put on him. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he be famous throughout Israel. May he will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you more than who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. There's this turnaround here, uh, not the least for Naomi, who started off this story bitter and empty and having lost everything. But now, holding in her arms a very real, a very concrete hope, a new life. And Ruth, too, Ruth has found a place to belong among the people of God. And even Boaz, I find Boaz uh, very interesting. Uh, a gentleman here at church pointed this out to me a few weeks after the second, uh, the second talk we had in the series. I was chatting with one of the guys afterwards, and he pointed me to the genealogy that we have right at the end of this book, which links Boaz and the son he has with Ruth, Obed, to or their direct ancestors of the man who will be Israel's greatest king, King David. But what's even more fascinating is the detail you get about Boaz's father, uh, if you look there, Boaz's father is a man called Salmon? Salmon? Salmon, I'm going to say, is interesting because he doesn't get a mention much in all of Scripture except here and one other place at the start of the Gospel of Matthew. I'll show you the verses in Matthew. Um, this, is a genealogy, this is the start of Matthew, Matthew 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So there it goes. It goes over the page. I won't read it all to you. I'll just point out the bit where um, Salmon is. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. So Boaz's mother was Rahab. And she is interesting because Rahab is a famous non-Jew. She was a Canaanite from the city of Jericho, if you remember. The first city that was conquered by Israel when Joshua led the people into the promised land and destroyed everything. And Rahab is the only Jerichoite left. She is the famous prostitute who sheltered Israeli spies in her house. And when the guards came looking for them, she let them escape out, out her window, lowering a rope down because her house was on the city wall. And her, Rahab and her family were the only ones spared out of all of Jericho because she chose to jump ship. She chose to join with Israel. Their people became her people. Israel's God became her God. And she apparently married an Israeli called Salmon. And Boaz is her son. And that starts to give me an insight into a couple of other things. One is that, well, it could explain Boaz's sympathy towards Ruth. He understands what it's like to be a foreigner in Israel, needing help. He's a halfie himself. He's grown up knowing what it's like to be an outsider. 
He's probably seen his mum and how people have treated her and how she's lived with perhaps the stigma of being a non-Israeli. And she was a prostitute too before she met his dad. Who knows how much of that stigma followed Boaz around when he was growing up. Oh, that's, that's Rahab's boy. The halfy. But it seems by the time Boaz has grown up, he's a man of standing in his own right. And I, but I wonder though if that could explain why someone like Boaz might still be not married, even though he's an older man. There's no mention of him having a wife or family before he meets Ruth in chapter 3. He seems flattered and honoured that she would ask him to be her guardian redeemer, even though there were plenty of younger men around. And so maybe he was still single because he was different and people held his family background against him. And if that's right, maybe this is also a story of Boaz finding hope too. God giving him a wife and a family long after he'd lost hope of finding anyone. Not that God owes us anything. I can't imagine the things we do impress God particularly. We can't manipulate him into giving us the things we want by bargaining with him as if he needs anything from us. Now, for some reason, God cares. Our lives, our, our struggles even, our toughest seasons and our darkest moments, they're lived out before him. And he is the audience of it all. Even what no one else sees, God sees. And he's there. He hears us. He hears the words we cry out in our souls that no one else hears. And he knows my struggles and he knows your struggles. He sees it all. Just like he sees Naomi in her bitterness, in her emptiness. How he sees Ruth. And how we respond to God, whether we're in trouble or not, how we respond to him matters to him. He will let people walk away if they choose to. But you could do a whole lot worse than moving yourself to the place where you know God is bringing his blessing. That's the one thing I think Naomi does right. Even when everything else is hopeless, she hears that God is blessing Israel. And so what does she do? She moves herself there. And then God does God things. Ruth too. She, she sides with God and God does not disappoint. Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Sure, life is hard, but it is a whole lot harder without Jesus. I get the privilege of attending more Christian funerals than most other people do. There'll be another one this coming Friday uh, for our dear sister, Betty McMinn. And what you learn going to so many Christian funerals, I'm reminded every time that walking with Jesus and him walking with us, we find a real hope that's grounded in reality. It's a hope that stays with us no matter what. A hope that stays with us that even death can't conquer. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow and a thousand blessings beside. Amen.